1 Corinthians 14, 33 to 35. Let me read this passage and then uh, get to the question. So the passage from 1 Corinthians 14, 33 to 35 says as follows. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all of the churches of the saints. Uh, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission. As the law also says, if there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. And the question is, um, does 1 Corinthians 14, 33 to 35 still apply today? Is it improper for women to read scripture verses or to pray in corporate worship setting? It's a great question and one that uh, deserves really a lot more treatment than I'm going to give very briefly. So feel free to ask me afterwards for more elaboration or if you want some stuff to read on it, happy to give it to you as well. Um, let, me, let me give two contexts. Context one is scriptural. Context two, today is cultural. And then let me just try to bring those two together. So scriptural. One of the things that was common um, in the New Testament, depending on the city and the church, would be this issue about everybody's roles and relationships. And so you had lots of different divisions and distinctions. Jewish people, non-Jewish people, uh, people who were slaves, people who were not slaves, um, adults versus children. And so there's different relationships they have. And one of the things that was unique and wonderful is how Jesus, through his ministry and into the church and its practice and putting into in practice the ministry, the teachings of Jesus, really became a kind of a transcultural place. It was radical. In fact, uh, a little sidebar comment about the significance of Jesus' teaching to women was so profound. Not only some of his followers, not the, the 12 disciples, but other followers like Mary and others, but also how he spoke directly to them and even commended them in a number of ways. We see them happening in a number of ways in his ministry. Well, in the time of the New Testament, now you're, you're a couple decades into having life being lived after the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension of Jesus, and the church is now being formed. What's happening is that you have cultural influence from the church, from outside the church, coming into the church, and what's happening. So, for example, in Corinth, in the city of Corinth, which would be a, very, a major, kind of very similar to Miami. It was a coastal city. It's on the water. A lot of international trade happening uh, lots of religious happenings happening going on there that were not Christian. You had religious temples and stuff. Um, you would have, in that situation, you would have female prostitutes. They'd have their heads shaved, by which you could participate in sexual activity with some of these female prostitutes, and you would be able to participate in worship services at those places of worship. These are, these are false gods in the places like this. So the idea of sexuality and gender is just distorted long before 2020, just to be clear. What's happening here in 1 Corinthians in the city of Corinth is trying to address the relationship of men and women in the church. Now, as I reference 1 Corinthians 14, the problem that he is getting at here is in the context of the spiritual gifts of what's happening, which is an issue that Paul brings up later in 1 Timothy 2. I'll turn there in a second. And it's the issue about how women are interacting in the service in a way that's disrespectful that is distracting to the service, but if you'll turn back to 1 Corinthians 11, we're just three chapters before, where he says this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions, even as I delivered them to you, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. There's the shaven issue there and the cultural issue. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she will, then she will cut her hair short, and it goes on to issues of head coverings. What I want to get to here is the issue that you see is the issue of submission, headship, roles and relationships, not an issue of dignity, made all in the image of God, equality, all access to God through faith in Christ, but differing responsibility and roles in their churches. The same topic, a different audience, Paul is writing, same author, but to a different, different writer, Paul says this in 1 Timothy so he's writing to 1 Timothy about the church at Ephesus. Different city now altogether. 1 Timothy chapter 2. He says this. 
I do not permit, in verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first and then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, for if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And then he goes on again in the chapter 3 about the qualifications of an elder. And the qualifications of an elder is that he must be the husband of one wife, that he must manage his household well, and how he does that accordingly. And the expectation is that God intended the leaders of the churches to be led by men. Again, not because of dignity, not because of equal opportunity and access to God. So the context here in the New Testament, culturally and biblically, is understanding that women had a role to play in the church, but they could overstep those boundaries in a way that would create distortion of roles and relationships, if not confusion, about the clear teaching of the Word of God. Here is the problem today. The problem today is there are often extremes in this regard. Extreme one that's very common in South Florida, particularly since we have a lot of Pentecostal churches, a lot of charismatic churches. Some of you come from Pentecostal and charismatic churches background, so this is a very disorienting answer right now already for you is that you see in those churches a lot of women serving as pastors, either on their own or as co-pastors with their husbands. And they're called that as well, pastor so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, pastor so-and-so. The problem is this is in direct contradiction what the Bible says should be leaders of the church. Now they try to do all kinds of hermeneutical gymnastics to get away with that, but biblically wouldn't be permitted. And again, I realize that might be disorienting for some of you, and I can unpack this more, but I've got a lot more questions to answer. The other extreme on this is, is, a, is the other kind of spectrum of conservative, which is that a woman really should have no public in any way communication or representation in any gathering of Christians. In fact, a text like 1 Corinthians 14 is kind of used as like a proof text. I think, though, humbly, kindly, out of context for what it was intended to say. For example, you already saw with us tonight, we had a woman read scripture. That was an exercise of participation in the body, but not an exercise of headship and authority over the body in that regards. But that's not because in any way women are less than men when it comes to dignity made in the image of God or equality as far as access to God with their own gifts and opportunities and relationships. Does that mean women can have the gift of teaching? Yes, they can. I think my own wife has a gift of teaching. But God is not calling them to be leaders in the church. Because of the same relationship we see in 1 Corinthians 11, God intends there to be roles and responsibilities. Now I realize there could be like 10 hands shoot up right now for follow-up. See me in the lobby afterwards for more follow-up because I've got to keep going with more questions. All right. Uh, next question. It got the next votes here. How do we process the idea of Christians who don't act very Christianly? Um... We, we process it uh, honestly, we process it humbly. Honestly, because just because someone becomes a Christian doesn't mean that they stop sinning. And, uh, and that needs to be admitted. We, we process it humbly because nor did we. It's so much easier to look at somebody else's sin and think, I cannot believe. And I'm not saying that we should somehow be comfortable with sin as if we should be like, yeah, you can, you know, worship God on Sunday and sleep with your girlfriend on Monday. That's fine. God kind of grades on a curve. As long as you say you love him, you're okay. No, that's not okay. We should talk. We should have like a come to Jesus talk out of like, want to love you and tell you the truth of God's word that can set you free from those desires of the flesh. But I also want to be very clear, the reason I say honestly and humbly is because I think sometimes we can very easily, kind of going back to Matthew 7, see the, the speck in somebody else's eye and miss the log in our own eye. And we can realize that we need the same thing they need, which is prayer, patience, pursuit. Math, Jesus says himself in Matthew 18, if you see somebody in sin, if somebody says, you should go after them, you should pursue them. Paul says in Romans uh, Galatians chapter 6, that you who are spiritual in a spirit of gentleness, you should go after them, you should pursue them, you should bring them back. 
Jude talks about those who are erring into false believing and false teaching, that you should win them back. So the idea here is that we should be honest about it. Now, there's another dimension to this I want to be honest about. Not everybody who says they're a Christian is a Christian. So just because you say it so doesn't make it so. I don't say that anyway judgmentally as if I know I've got some sort of like pastor glasses like, yep, yep, ooh, questionable. I don't know. Only God knows. And I do know that people deceive themselves into thinking they're Christians when they're not. And to their defense, maybe it's because they've been told by others, oh, you're a Christian. And it's because they've been told that because like they did something Christianly. They like walked an aisle, prayed a prayer. They went to church for a number of years. They kind of said a prayer to maybe a camp or something, or at one time they're kind of serious about God and they used to carry around a Bible all the time. Those things, like, that's, that, that's what I did, and therefore I'm a Christian. Like, I don't know. Jesus says in John 15, if you abide in him, then you are one of his. So I think the challenge is, for those of you who maybe are not Christians, and you're like, what's up with you Christians? You guys are a little bit, you got your act, you know, kind of jacked up. I just want to say to you humbly, I'm not sure everybody who says to you that they're a Christian Maybe they're a Christian. Maybe they are. I, don't, I just don't know who you're talking to. So I do know that there are false professions. Jesus talks about this all the time. John talks about this. They went out from us because they're not from us. So I'll say it like this. There is a place for the assurance of salvation to be talked about for Christians to struggle with assurance because they feel like they're never good enough for God to truly love them. And I would just want to tell that Christian who's struggling with their assurance of salvation, God loves you not because of what you do, but because of what he's done for you in Christ. Your hope is there and only in there, and you can be assured that that work was enough for you. That's the assurance of salvation God wants you to have in Christ. However, flip that around. There are other people who believe they have assurance of salvation I think should not have it. Some people will say the devil wants you to doubt your salvation. I say sometimes the devil wants you to not doubt your salvation and believe that you're okay with God when you're really not. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13 that you should test yourself. You should examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. So Christians have a category. We speak honestly and openly about sin. We are, we just be clear, we didn't stop sinning. We're just repenting sinners. And sometimes we need the help of each other to help remind us to repent. So if you see me in sin, you come to me and you bring my sin to, to my attention. And you say, Eric, here's where I think the scripture is, is telling you you're wrong. And I would do the same for you, and you do the same for each other. So we walk honestly and humbly. All right, next question. Um, considering the current state of civil unrest in some of our major cities, what is the biblical stance in taking up arms to defend family or self? Okay, uh, let me just talk about this idea of biblical arms, uh, like, you know, the idea of, like, you know, gun control. Does, what does the Bible say about gun control? First of all, uh, the Bible's written before there were guns, so we should just be clear on that. Um, so it didn't have a lot to say about gun control, not controlling anybody's guns. Um, but sort of the larger conversation um, about, you know, where is the place for civil unrest and protecting ourselves. Uh, the, I want to be clear to kind of frame this conversation. There is nothing wrong if you are desiring to protect personal property or your personhood or those on behalf of your family. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I do think recognizing that we live in the context of Romans 13, we live under governmental authority that God gives, and that's not just the United States of America. The problem I see sometimes with Americans who are Christians, or maybe phrasing that differently, Christians who are American, is they get their like Americana mixed into their Christianity. It gets really confusing. So that it's like, you know, God bless America, and we almost become like the new Israel. Like, you know, God's got a lot to say about Israel, and that's kind of us, and, and like a lot of Christians will like read the Old Testament, like that's pretty much America, and like I, I, I always feel bad for telling people this, but like it's not, I mean, it's really not, we're like not even in the Bible. Like we're not even there. It's like, I know we're pretty impressed with ourselves, and we're pretty thankful, but we're not even there. We're not even mentioned. So I think there should be some humility, and I say that because recognize that there are Christians living in other parts of the world where their governments have decided other things that they can or cannot do regarding guns or other way of personal property and possession, and they submit to that. They submit to that. 
But the idea here of us as Christians um, recognizing the laws that have been put over us, we want to recognize that whatever we do, we want to honor the Lord. We want to honor the Lord with and respond with. Um, I do think in Luke 22, there's an example of a situation where uh, Jesus is sending out people um, and someone was carrying a weapon for self-defense, was never condemned in the Bible. So it's not as if that's a wrong uh, play, as if somehow you're breaking the Bible. Um, and I just think in this context, the framework in which we're dealing is responsible provision and protection within the boundaries of what we're allowed to based on our governing authorities, recognizing that will change, but your Christianity does not. Um, so that's my brief answer on that. Uh, next question. Uh, how can we pray for you and the fam? Well, that's incredibly kind. I'd like to name you my favorite person here tonight. Um, okay, how can you pray? Um, one, pray for me to keep loving my wife, loving my children, walk in obedience to the word. I honestly feel like if I can make it to the end of my life, not having cheated on my wife, not having like cheated on my taxes, not having like, you know, beaten my children, just like faithful Christianity, I will have won. And obviously Christ in me. I say this because I, I, I learned um, two weeks ago of a pastor friend um, who uh, left his wife and kids for another man. And uh, it just has devastated the church. And I, mean, I knew him for years, worked with him. Um, I texted him, and I, I love you. I'm praying for you. Um, so I don't, I'm not looking for prayers to be like exceptional. I would just love like faithful prayers to just be like average. Like, God, we just pray for our pastor that he would love you. He would love his word. Um, give him wisdom when he makes decisions. Um, help him not define his identity and the size of Grace Church, but just the faithfulness of Grace Church. Um, help him to be patient with raising his sons. I have three sons, 20, 18, and 17. Um, I'm reminded more than ever, those are an offering unto the Lord. Um, they're given to me as a gift for a season of time, and I want to honor Christ with them, but I don't know what's going to happen. I've done all that I know to do and keep trying to do that, but it's really the Lord's plan in their life, and I want to trust him with that. Um, so yeah, just just... I'm aware of what you're aware of. I mean, Peter says, 1 Peter 4, the devil's like a roaring lion seeking those whom he may devour. And uh, a lot of Christians can get very discouraged when pastors are destroyed in their marriages or their ministries. We have countless examples of that just here in South Florida. So I just want to be a boring, faithful pastor um, who loves his wife, dates her every week, loves his sons, hugs him a ton, loves you guys, prays for you like crazy, preaches the Bible, not perfectly, but I pray faithfully, and then go to bed every night and just repeat the next day. And if you'd pray for that, that would be awesome. So there's that answer. Next, is cussing casually as a form of expression anti-Christian? Um, so this is, a, this is a great question because I find that this is one of those uh, things that younger Christians are trying to figure out like where their liberty can like permit versus, uh, versus uh, restrict. Uh, first of all, I think cussing should be just recognized as being culturally uh, defined. So there's cultural limitations. I say that because in Miami, we have a lot of people come from a lot of countries who speak a lot of different languages. And so sometimes some of us are saying things to each other like, I did not know that was a bad thing to say. I am so sorry. Right? Like if you're in Australia, you don't call somebody the synonym for somebody who's on the street as a homeless person. I'm not saying the word because I even feel bad if you're from Australia here. I didn't want to say that because that would be a bad word. Uh, but we would know that here. There's just, so my point is recognize that there's cultural expressions of what's appropriate and not appropriate. But having said that, here's the problem I think it goes on. I think um, under the banner of Christian liberty, Christians demonstrate a ton of immaturity. A ton of immaturity. I find that this question, not the person asking it, but this, this challenge, is like a teenage boy asking, how far can you go with a teenage girl and it be okay? 
I didn't have sex with her. So I'm technically not fornicating. So it's okay that we were like, our clothes were off and we were like doing anatomy lessons, but nothing happened. Like, are you, you're for real on that. You're for real. That, my point is, that kind of way of thinking about law and how much license I can get away with from the Bible shows how much immaturity I think people struggle with. So instead, I think we take a look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 it talks about this idea of our speech and what it should be looking like and how it's not known for coarse jesting. How we could speak to each other in a way that shows that we are peacemakers. We think about Matthew chapter 5. That we speak words that are edifying. That we speak according to 1 Peter, the words that gives an answer for the hope that's within us. What I find is cuss words either represent anger or immaturity. I'm mad, and I find that my words that are seemingly domesticated don't capture it enough, and I want to go to like the next level. I'm just saying, then you are emotionally unhinged. Your problem is not your vocabulary. Your problem is your heart. But your vocabulary has given us a good window into your heart right now. But maybe it's not anger. Maybe it's just like how you want to process your day. You want to talk about your coworkers. You want to talk about you know, your, your roommate to your family members or your family members to your roommates. I just think of you as being an immature communicator who can't speak in a way that would be worth imitating. Because Christians are to call to live imitatable lives. I want anything I say to be something my sons can say in any context they could say it. I want anything I process to be something by which any of you could listen in on and you could repeat it yourself. Because that's the example that Paul wants to set for Timothy. He wants an imitation to be the example that's worth repeating. Let me keep going. Uh, is prayer a two-way conversation? I hear many say that when they pray at times, God speaks to them in prayer. What does the Bible say of this? Um, okay, so, and then I see the next couple ones. So the, the idea here, I'm just trying to do this briefly because I want to respect your time. You're going longer than normal and I don't want to exasperate you uh, tonight. Um, so prayer is, I would say, a one-way conversation that you are speaking to God. The word is the, return conversation of how God speaks to you. Now, some people will say, but doesn't God speak to me when I'm praying? And I would ask the question, based on what? If you're going to say, based upon examples I read in Scripture, I would say you need to be very careful when you use Scripture as your descriptive versus prescriptive practice. In other words, some of you are single, and you want to be married. And you might want to look to the Bible. Understandably, it's a good instinct. What does the Bible say I should do on how I should get married? Well, I guess to tell you right now, you don't want to go to the Bible to answer that question. Because the examples it gives of how people get married are crazy. They are crazy. They are descriptive what people did, not prescriptive of what people should do. I say that because when you come, for example, into the book of Acts, now we're out of the context of relationship in the conversation of prayer, is God speaking in the Bible? Yes. But it's interesting that when he is speaking, he is speaking in several contexts. Number one, he is speaking in a way that the Bible affirms it. And number two, he is speaking when the Bible hadn't yet been completed and provided for them. So when you're talking about God speaking to you today, it gets a little tricky if you're talking about divine revelation. Because I know perhaps some of you speak like this today. You're like, hey, I really believe God wanted me, and you fill in the blank. Okay, I'm okay if you say that. But here's the problem if you say that you don't really actually fully know. Outside of whatever it is that yet desire is, is confirmed by scripture as being good and right. So for example, you're like, I feel like God wants me to witness to this person, to tell them about Jesus. Well, I don't know who this person is, but I do know that God wants everybody to know about Jesus. And for those who have never heard about Jesus or given life to Jesus, and that's the person you've identified, I can trust that that desire is from God. So here's where I'm comfortable in that sort of perspective as far as God speaking today, is does God move through the desires of our heart to direct us in our desires to take action that we otherwise would not do ourselves? A hundred percent yes. That's just what I said today in Matthew 7, 12, which is your desire to act on what Jesus is saying and to continue to act is a demonstration of God has changed your desires to do what you naturally would not otherwise do. 
But the problem comes if you are thinking more in a kind of a subjective way of I'm praying to God, and then while I'm praying, I think God is telling me right now that, that I have a word for someone here that I need to tell you. Okay, that, that is subjective impressionism. That's just that. It's subjective. It has no binding divine authority that you could confidently say, thus saith the Lord. I realize that is different from perhaps a lot of you and maybe what you've seen or heard or maybe been taught by others. And I mean no offense by that. But I mean to save to you from Scripture that even when Scripture was given, and you have this in context of 1 Corinthians, a book we've already looked at earlier today, when these prophecies were being given, that they were to be tested by the Word of God. So that every desire that is being tested out and weighed according to what Scripture says. So, hope that answers the question about prayer. Okay, um, I'm gonna. I am going to. Okay, I'm going to go to the last question, as our last question. Uh. And the reason I'm doing this is because I don't want a person to not have gotten the votes have gotten the answer. Uh, do you really believe the stories of the Bible that we read in the Bible actually happened, or are they just stories? This is a great question. Uh, I really do believe that they are historical records. And I believe that for several reasons. Before I give those reasons, let me back up when I talk about the Bible. The Bible is, in the words of itself, is inspired, meaning it, it comes from God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it talks about how it's God-breathed. He is like, like you're breathing in that mask right now that you're so tired of wearing right now. He, he breathes the word, so it is inspired. Secondly, the Bible is inerrant, which means it's not just from God, it is without errors, without any distortion. Now, that means in the original autographs, as they're called, the original writings, what we have are records of the originals, but they are, by all the textual comparison, not very far off of the originals. And that's a much longer conversation I could explain to you. So it's inspired. It's from God. It's an error. It's without error. So that's the second thing. Third thing is, is that it is authoritative, meaning if God says it, we should do it. It isn't like you can hear and like, well, that's kind of your opinion, but I'm going to choose something else. Like if God says it, whatever God's word says, we do. Fourth, it is clear. Notice, isn't it as if God struggles for clarity in how to talk to people? Like, wow, he's impressive. He can create, but he can't seem to communicate that clearly. No, God can communicate quite clearly. I recognize it's coming through cultural records and coming through different contexts, but he can communicate clearly. Fifth and final, it is sufficient, meaning everything man needs for life and godliness, according to the Word of God, is in the Word of God. Now, why do I believe these stories? Because some of them just seem like crazy, remarkable dare I even say miraculous? He walked on water. The sun was stopped. A Red Sea, not the Reed Sea, as my professor in college tried to teach me, but the Red Sea actually parted? Yes, friend. And the reason I believe them to be true is the same reason I believe at the very beginning of the Bible to be true. That what God created, he created because he spoke into existence. See, the problem for me is not in any one of the stories. The problem otherwise for me would be in the very beginning of the story. I, I accept what the, what the word says from the beginning to end. You don't have to look at my hands in, in Genesis 1. You can go to Revelation 5, the last book in the Bible, where it says in Genesis chapter 5, as the elders are seated on the throne, as the hosts are declaring him about him being worthy and holy and glory. And it says, for whom he created all things. So a God who creates, which is itself a miracle, can do every other thing on record there. Now, is there archaeological support for these events? Yes. Is there scientific explanations that begin to be learning today that can help support some of this stuff? Yes. But is it a point at which every story will be answered to the human reasoning mind that will take away the place of the need for faith in your mind? No. Faith in Christ. But it's not blind faith. It's not dumb faith. It's not against the laws of science and illogical faith. It's a God who created, who sustains, who does all things for his glory. It's faith in that God, which is the best place to put your faith. 
And the one who created you, Colossians 1, sustains you and continues to provide for you. 